We are not alone. You are watching Contact TV with your hosts, Leslie Mitchell Clark and Wes Roberts. Exploring ufology, metaphysics, and beyond with the world's foremost experts. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of our uh, fellow Terrans and those of us beyond those uh, domains. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to another episode of Contact, whether you're enjoying us on uh, the YouTube channel or our many podcast platforms. We're so happy that you tuned in. And uh, let me introduce my partner in crime here, Wes Roberts, uh, who's going to be uh, jumping down the rabbit hole with uh, all of us in just a minute. And um, it is our great pleasure to welcome uh, a guest this evening who uh, I've long been aware of, actually. I'm having a little bit of hero worship, I, I don't mind telling you, <laughs> but uh, just a little bit. But um, we are welcoming to the program Les Velez, and uh, he's a graduate of the University of Vermont with a bachelor degree of science in uh, business administration. And beginning in September of 1970, he also served in the U.S. Army as a field artillery officer and was later vice president of Luscombe Engineering, a Silicon Valley Valley-based manufacturer's representative company. He joined MUFON, and we're going to get in. There's a big, there should be a paragraph here, an indentation. <laughs> then he joined MUFON, uh, <laughs> as you all know, the Mutual UFO Network in 1991, and he has held the following positions, field investigator, training coordinator for field investigators, assistant state director in Northern California, chairman of the AERC, that's the Abduction Experience Research Committee, and team leader of the ART, Abduction Response Team. Now, also during that time, uh, Les became a facilitator for an abduction support group in San Jose, California. And in 1994, he co-founded Opus, which we're going to really delve into, which is the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support. And so without any further foo for all, I, I'm very <laughs> honored <laughs> to welcome to the program this evening, Mr. Lester Les Velez. How Thank are you? you? I love Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I look forward to our chat tonight. Wonderful. Right. So, you know, as we jump in here and I, you know, I think I mentioned this before we actually, you know, went on the air. How did you segue into MUFON and an interest mm. in um, uh, ultra terrestrials or unknown craft or any of the above? Well, you have to back back up in my lifetime to when I was 11 years old. Oh. <clears throat> when I was living in Connecticut and uh, I was coming into the into the house, it was uh, late October uh, and uh, it was uh, like dusk, almost almost, you know, totally dark at that point. But I noticed this craft oh. totally silent, hovering over a tree line near my house. And uh, it was, you know, this Ovid type of a, of a shape and uh it was kind of whitish uh but again it wasn't making any sounds and it just moved very slowly and it scared the crap out of me <laughs> and i ran in the house and tried to get my father to come out and by the time i was able to get him out uh the craft had disappeared and he's and he said to me he says well it was probably just a beacon of light reflecting off a cloud yeah. and i said okay I, you know I heard what he said, but I didn't believe it. Mm. And uh, based on what I saw. And so I, shortly thereafter, I went to the uh, public library there in, in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut, South Norwalk, actually, and uh, picked up some books on UFOs. And at that time, uh, George Adamski was the big, big uh, celebrity in oh, that yeah. regard. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is late, late 50s. And uh, so I started to read about that and I was really super excited about it. And, uh, and then I became, you know, a little bit more uh, mature and I kind of forgot about it. And, um, you know, uh, girls became a little bit more important in my life at that point. And uh, 
I uh, eventually went off to college and uh, uh, subsequently uh, went into the service. And uh, in 1985, I moved out to uh, San Jose, California. Mm. And I picked up the San Jose Mercury News and uh, I saw that Stanton Freeman was going to talk about UFOs and a cover, uh, <laughs> UFO cover up. And it was like somebody threw a switch. Like I had kind of forgotten about the whole thing, that, that episode. And then it was like, oh, my God, I got to go see this guy. And so he was going to talk at San Jose City College. And um, so I went there expecting to see a handful of people. But the auditorium was packed. Wow. And, and uh, he gave this uh, his usual inevitable, uh, you know, lectures. And on the way out, um, MUFON had a table there in the foyer and uh, they were talking about their monthly journal. And so I decided, OK, I'm going to sign up and get their journal. And after a while, that wasn't enough for me. And so I became a field investigator. Mm -hmm. And that's when things really got interesting, because almost without exception, the cases I got involved with were not only sightings, but they were, people talked about the fact that they had contact with non-human intelligences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, that, that kind of blew me away. And one of the people uh, one day, uh, one of these uh, experiencers asked if I knew of other people having similar experiences. And I said, yes, I do. And um, next thing I know, I'm facilitating a support group in San Jose. And I brought in a, uh, a, uh, a mental health practitioner uh, by the name of June Steiner, who is actually on our board uh, mm -hmm. right now. And because uh, I wanted to have somebody with those kind of credentials uh, in those meetings. And yes, uh, that's when things really got interesting. I mean, I, I learned so yeah. much listening to these people talk about their experiences and the trauma that they were going through and, and the, the needs that they had and, and the concerns that they had because they couldn't talk to family members. They couldn't talk to, uh, uh, you know, job mates. And, and I mean, it just goes on and on that it became such a, a problem for these people. So in, uh, I was eventually written up in, in the Monterey Coast Weekly paper by uh, this reporter who found out that I was doing these kind of things. And he published this article. And uh, uh, hold on a second. I got a phone call coming in. Hold on a second. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> this is live. Okay, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> anyway, it's, a... anyway, it's Washington. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> this time you've me. said too much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, I... I um, uh, where the hell was I? <laughs> what was I talking about? <laughs> the Monterey anyway. article. Yeah, Monterey. Monterey okay, article. right. So, so anyway, um, I was written up in this article about what I was doing with MUFON and the investigations I was doing. And uh, um, there was another uh, woman that was written up in the same article about the things that she was doing. And shortly thereafter, I got a call from her. And she was telling me about the fact that she was in contact with these off earthly entities. And she wanted to know what was going on in her brain when this was going on. Oh. And so I said, wow, that's, that's quite interesting. But I, you know, I was thinking in my, my mind that how can I possibly help this person? Mm -hmm. And then she said she was working with the emergency room doctor down in Carmel. And so <laughs> I, uh, I right away thought of my friend, uh, Dr. Eugene Lipson, who is a doctor and uh, who was very interested in meeting other professionals, doctors especially. And so I called him up and I said, you know what, why don't we go down and see this person? Because she's working with this emergency room doctor. So we did. We took one Saturday afternoon and went down there and uh, we walked into her house. And on the wall, there was a picture hanging there, which was kind of interesting to me. So I asked her about it and I said, you know, what is this picture about? And she said, well, I'm standing on the back of this, you know, craft that's in the Caribbean. 
uh, not a not a UFO, a boat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, when you wow. say craft, you know, you have to be careful. <laughs> and, and so I said, well, what were you doing there? And she says, well, I was helping these treasure hunters find treasure. I said, well, how were you doing that? She says, well, I was in contact with the captain of the galleon that had gone down. <laughs> well, that started the whole afternoon. Wow. I mean, it was like the, the Whoa. first thing. Okay. And, what we found out was that she had had a near death experience and became very psychic mm -hmm. afterwards. And um, mm. so, <laughs> and she started to tell us things about ourselves that were, was amazing. There was no possible way. We, we didn't know her from Adam uh, until she called us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we were just amazed. And when we, Jean and I left that afternoon, we just said, oh, how can we possibly help people like this? And that's when Opus was hatched. And in 1994, mm -hmm. we officially became a 501c3 nonprofit organization recognized by the IRS, which always cracks me up. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, and that, that was the beginning of, of this, this journey. Uh, and Opus has been basically helping people that are having paranormal experiences. And as it's turned out, the majority of people that contact us are those that have had contact with non-human intelligences, <laughs> you know, the classic abduction type cases, uh, if you will, uh, contact or experience is the, the mm -hmm. common word now. Um, so, um, and, and, but that doesn't mean that we don't look at other things like demon possession or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Kundalini awakening or, mm -hmm. or things of that nature. Uh, but what we generally do is refer people when they come to us for those kind of things to other organizations that we have um, mutual um, agreements with. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so that's how I got started. Wow, that's that is incredible. And well, you know, the, one of the interesting things that you point out here immediately is how, you know, because you're you were thought you were dealing with one thing and there then here's a woman who obviously is a gifted psychic has tremendous psi skills mm -hmm. and i think and i'm often asked this myself if i were to pick out a commonality between all of the experiencers whether it was a positive one or more like an abduction abduction all of the experiences what what is the biggest commonality because this this type of experience certainly crosses through every financial cultural um uh you know, philosophical boundary mm -hmm. racial that there is so i have to say that uh psychic ability uh seems to be the thing uh, you know, I have rarely worked with an experiencer who didn't have significant PSI ability that leaked over into other areas of, of phenomena. Now, whether this is transferred genetically and certain ETs are interested in that or whether it's just easier for benevolent ETs to communicate with those of us that maybe have a, I'm not including myself, but the, the people on this planet that have a little mm -hmm. extra dose of that ability, maybe it's just plain easier for them uh, yeah. rather than to get down to our rudimentary uh, 3D uh, meat suit slogging through the, you know, prim primordial ooze type mm -hmm. of thing we got going here. No, absolutely. I, you know, I'm always, uh, amazed about the people with psychic abilities. And I have a number of friends that are psychics and the ability to not only look at the past, uh, the present, but the future as mm -hmm. to what, and there's so many stories out there of events. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard the story about this uh, woman doctor that had gone on a, uh, uh, a basic uh, journey down in South America, a kayaking uh, trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had, you know, gone over the this falls and got trapped underneath the falls for over 30 minutes. Wow. And most people would be dead. Mm -hmm. But during that period of time, she saw these entities that were super loving and she did not want to, you know, go back uh, to normal life. She wanted to go with them. Mm -hmm. And then they told her at that point that, no, you need to go back. There's things that you, you have to do. 
And uh, they also told her this fact, which blew my mind, that her son, who was small at that time, when he turned 18, would uh, have an accident and, and succumb to the accident in the accident. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so, of course, she never said anything to her son uh, and eventually probably just forgot about it. And sure enough, after he turned 18, shortly thereafter, he got into an accident and he was killed. And so <laughs> talk about going down the rabbit hole. I mean, these are these are the kind of things that uh, just uh, boggle the mind. I mean, you know, whether or not these psychic abilities are um, transmitted uh, generationally, uh, which seems to be the case. Uh, you know, if you talk to these people, you know, their parents or their grandparents or have that ability. Um, is this something that was uh, uh, brought on by the uh, these intelligences at some point uh, in, you know, eons ago. And that's why they follow people because they have that ability. Uh, I mean, these are all wonderful questions and we don't have definitive answers. Uh, Gary Nolan from Stanford university, you know, has worked with these kind of people and um, he's, he's actually an experiencer himself. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and he basically said that the government has been covering this stuff up, um, that the Wilson report uh, is absolutely true, that there's crash retrievals going on. Um, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And oh, yeah. On. It's ridiculous. In fact, you know, the late the late Paul Hellyer, I don't know if you ever had a chance to meet him, Les. He no. was such a wonderful man, lovely man, intelligent. And like yourself, you know, he was like a, an economist. I mean, he had a very substantial uh, early education that was mm. quite different from what. And he was a uh, for a while. He was what oh, yeah. was it? Was, yeah, he was our secretary. Minister, well, yeah, he was our secretary yeah, of defense yeah. and deputy prime minister. And also he was yeah. a provincial premier premier i believe anyway he shortly before he died uh, he told me that to his knowledge from the last time he was really hooked in you know to the government yeah. that there were at least 85 different species that uh canada was openly communicating with doing business with engaging with Etc. Etc. Et and so, you. of course, Canada. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. But you know, Canada and the U.S. are obviously in bed together, and you know, mm -hmm. the, the, much of there's been a lot of phenomena around the Dew Line, which was, of course, a nuclear right. kind of situation. In fact, have have you have you found less is because you're right up to the minute, and you have a great par view over you know the people that are making reports. Um, I have found in my little macro microcosm here that the um, the most horrific things that people have been through um, seem to be happening at the hands of uh, the SSP, if you will, or or strangely intentioned, uh, you know, uh, collaborations mm -hmm. between various ETs and, and humans. And this, mm -hmm. of course, is another thing that's been kept a secret. But uh, I, I think that these, the worst things that I hear about are really at the hands of other humans. Yep. So what, yeah, are we so, you know, what are we so afraid of? Yeah, you know, Melinda Leslie talks about the mill lab uh, uh, type of uh, situation. Lab, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, she uh, she's one of our advisors uh, for Opus. And, oh, she's uh, wonderful. Oh, and along with uh, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, Terry Lovelace and mm -hmm. uh, Yvonne Smith. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got some really good advisors on our team. But, uh, yeah, I mean, th there's all kinds of things of that nature. You know, are we talking about strictly extraterrestrial or interdimensional or time travelers or the all military? Of it. Absolutely. All of it. It's, it's all of it's it. All, it's all of it because, you know, yeah. linear time doesn't exist. We have invented it as a way to uh, show up on time and get stuff done. But in reality, yeah, what time is it, by the way? What the hell? <laughs> I don't know. I, I threw away linear time and, and, I, time, uh, ma and time magazine at the same time. Okay. Good thing you're I, here, Wes. Good thing you're here, Wes, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be, I don't know where. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tune back in when it's time. Um, well, Wes, I, it's I, time for it's time for you to come back in because now this is you're the you're the person in this room who can really discuss the the types of experiences and what the worst things were and what the best things were. Well, I, I'd love to follow up with you, Les, on, sure. on a question that's occurred to my mind, because I'm one of those psychic people. I've known hmm. that since my teens. Um, so when I underwent hypnosis uh, with Leslie, and it's about 30 plus sessions over five years, um, we discovered, or Leslie discovered, she found out that it, they were attracted to me because of my psi capabilities. But I, mm -hmm. what I want to ask you as a follow-up is, which comes first, the psi capabilities or them? Yeah, that's all the chicken and the egg uh, yeah. scenario. Um, well, you know, there, there's both sides of that coin, supposedly, uh, that uh, they, they, you know, supposedly they have created this ability in us eons ago, and then they're following you know, generation after generation, um, or it, it's, it's a peculi peculiarity in our DNA structure uh, where the uh, connections between the caudate and the putamen area, there's more mm -hmm. connections in that part of the brain with people mm -hmm. that have that psychic ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, is this a natural effect um, that that's just, you know, come about uh, after, after so many generations? Or is it, again, you know, something that they created? Um, we, we don't have a definitive answer for that. That would be me, too. No. That would be me, too, Les. I don't either. And that's why I would, I, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. And I'm not sure Leslie and I have the answer either. No. Which, no. Which, uh, which plays into which? Well, yeah. except that I would, it, it seems to me that we are, well, we are we have imperfections in our genome uh, for instance uh, as as humanoids as homo sapiens sapiens i think we are subject to over 6000 different types of genetic things that can go wrong i mean really wrong mm -hmm. there is no other species on this earth animal uh vegetable <laughs> there is no other living creature on this earth that has anything like that potential for genetic failure yeah. so my feeling kind of is that we are the result of genetic tinkering which mm. was which was in fact mm. imperfect because we're not talking about gods we're talking about humanoids maybe from another place well this is something too that uh, people often talk about the fact that why well, if they're so smart why do they keep abducting us why do they keep taking yes. us you know and 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 what i what i have to say about that is is it's very similar to what we do to uh lower forms of of life i don't think we're at the top of the food chain <laughs> there's there's a whole nother level above us and yeah. just like we you know we go out and we capture a dolphin and we uh, tag him we take blood samples we measure them mm -hmm. and then we throw them back in the water and come back a year later and do the same thing and then the other thing that i think about is the fact that this is a school this is a school that these aliens bring their their children or you know their young ones to understand, well, this is how you manipulate a human. This is what you do to the human. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that you know, that's all. That's that's plausible, albeit a, a, a bit dark. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay. reality. That's true. Yeah. But you know, on the on on the other hand, um, you know, could we could we not be going through? a natural process and you know i mean I, what a sure. message that i've heard a few times from different experiencers if you will is that this planet our planet is is quite unique in the fact that we have such a huge uh, span of development i mean we have human beings with very low intelligence who are not educated who might be violent or whatever. we have beings like that we have the Dalai Lama and, and, you know, evolved souls also still in physical form. And I think that in our soul group or in our, you know, our corner of the universe, 
this is in a sense a a a the cruel school and that many of us have chosen to be here now to help with whatever um upgrade uh, can happen because there has to be an upgrade we cannot continue on with the low vibration the low hateful vibrations of half the planet it's mm -hmm. it's it's something something's got to give i think either we succumb to the to our <clears throat> violence or we evolve and i think we're actually ha having a lot of help uh in increasing mm -hmm. our vibration mm -hmm. uh, i think that many many experiencers have also are doing like jobs they seem to be having more um uh, you know, psychophysical experiences of more like astral projection rather yeah. than being forcibly taken physically. And right. in these experiences, they seem to be working alongside at various tasks <laughs> of, of different kinds of ETs. So, yeah, there, um, there, there are various uh, uh, studies that have been done, um, uh, including the one that I was involved with called the Omega-3 study that uh, was funded by MUFON back in 2009, um, that these people, most of, most of the people uh, that are having the experiences don't want it to stop, like 70%, 80%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only about 20% want it to stop. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I, I, my, my latest theory is that every one of us has had an experience, whether or not we consciously remember it. I believe um, I'm with you, Boo Boo. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> you know, I had I had one of the support group meetings. Uh, a person in the group said to me, he "said I've seen you before." I said, "Really?" At a UFO conference? No, I saw you on board the craft. I said, "Really?" Oh, and I kind of I kind of you know blew it off. And it was like a year, year and a half later that a totally different person said, I've seen you before. And I said the same thing. Where are you? UFO no, no, no. You were sitting on this bench on the craft naked and you were freaking out. And they told me to go over to you to calm you down. Oh my gosh. And so at that point, I decided wow. to get regressed. I had three separate regressions and uh, found out nothing along those lines, but I had multiple past lives, mm -hmm. multiple past oh. lives. And subsequently, someone said to me, well, perhaps this person somehow tapped into a past life that you had and where you probably were abducted. And so uh, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating how, how all these things are interconnected in some way, shape or form. And um, we just don't have all the answers or even some. <laughs> Yeah, I know. And, you know, I think in regression, Les, I think, and Wes as well, I, I, I think that we hear what we need to hear, um, that the information that we need at that time is what tends to come forward. So for whatever reason, I would venture to say your past life experiences that you heard about in that session were of deeper relevance mm -hmm. at that moment than perhaps some of your other things as an experiencer. Um, we just, you know, I used to direct people a whole lot. You know, you're going, you know, really take them like to the time and place where the where the memory starts, you know, dissolving. But um, given my druthers, I leave it to that person's uh, soul memory to go to where they need to go for mm -hmm. whatever they need to hear because our subconscious mind is plugged into the grid i mean we we have access to all information if we choose to accept uh -huh. that we do i think uh -huh. Uh -huh. but um les did you ever um it, so and in, in that particular time it, it was you experienced some some past lives have you ever had any of the you know what we you know the telltale signs of of, of an abduction experience of uh, missing memory or missing time or anything <clears throat> kind of yeah, like that the only thing that uh, that i really put two and two together over was the fact that most of my my past lives were military oriented um mm -hmm. Uh, I was I was a uh, a 
shogun in Japan in one wow. lifetime. Wow. I was I was a Hellenic Greek soldier on another time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was an Irishman fighting wars in <laughs> in Ireland. <laughs> And yeah. now, you know, I've, I've been an artillery officer in this lifetime. So this is a very common thread that I have of this military background uh, for whatever reason. And uh, that first one, when I was a shogun, was was absolutely uh, very, very lonely because I, I loved someone, but I could never be with them. Mm-hmm. And, you oh. know, it, <laughs> I was literally crying my yeah. eyes out when I was telling this story. And, uh, and, and that's when you, when you, when that it impacts you that way, there's definitely something that that's gone on. I mean, you oh, just yeah. don't start crying over nothing. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's one of the ways that we know that the person is having a legitimate experience. It is the, it is the <laughs> connection between the emotions and, and the telling just the objective telling of what they see. Yeah. yeah. So that is a, well, that is, that's really fascinating. Um, Wes, what, do, what do you have to say about um, how your experiences have changed over the years Hmm. And and how that might, you know, how, you know, how that has, in fact, affected you and 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 other people like Wes who are probably uh, other people like Les who are probably lifelong experiencers as well. So this this is why we make such a great trio in this show, um, this particular show. I um, the easiest way for me to put this would be to say it has broadened my horizons. Um, mm-hmm. You know, another way to say is my compassion has gone up. Um, my psychic abilities have gone up. But uh, I guess underlying all those things, and, and less, I'm sure you can speak to this too, I have integrated this. I was at a point earlier on before Leslie, this was not in the least integrated, and mm-hmm. I was fighting it, and I was playing victim, and I know I'm not a victim. I chose this. So, it's so very, I'd love to hear what yeah, you say. Yeah, I mean, it, it. You hit the nail on the head. This is exactly the kind of thing that goes on because it, in the very beginning stages, it's it's a rough ride. Uh, I mean, it's very traumatic, mm-hmm. um, and then then you reach a point where you, you're more comfortable with what's going on, especially if you get the kind of help like uh, you know Leslie was able to mm-hmm. give you, um, and 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 then in the later stages. Uh, when it stops, it's almost like the Stockholm syndrome because people start wondering why. Why is this not? They're not coming back. You know, they're not coming for me anymore. Uh, but there, there is a definite process that goes on uh, with this, and uh, you know, you you just enumerated that beautifully. <laughs> it was definitely uh, the stages that you talk about were, were right on. Well, thank you for that. I, you were talking about the omega-3 study before. Does this play into yeah. that? Did you notice those things? Well, what, what we did, uh, again, this was funded by MUFON because I had called uh, James Carrion, who was the international director at the time, and told him that uh, I think they were missing the boat because they were basically a nuts and bolts kind of an organization yeah. and were not paying attention to people that claimed that they had contact. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we worked out a deal um, whereby Opus was getting, I was personally getting all the phone calls that were coming into MUFON uh, whereby people were asking for help. Mm-hmm. And so I, I did the triage on those kind of things. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when after a while, they came back to me and said, look, we'd like you to, to come up with a project, uh, you know, some type of a study. And so uh, I put together a, a group of people and uh, two main psychologists that I started to work with. And we took 71 people that were uh, claimed that they had contact and 51 people that were a control group. And uh, let me read you the, uh, the findings. Okay? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. This please is what do. We found. 
In general, abductees experiences profile differently than do their comparison counterparts on a number of general psychological and specific neurological variables. Yet there are remarkable similarities between the experiential group and the comparison group. It should be noted that in no case did experiencers or comparison group participants show any signs of mental illness or personality disorder. And that's very important right there. Very, very. Fantasy proneness does not appear to play a differentiating role between the experiential and the control group. And I mean, th this is one of the things debunkers like to talk about. You know, these people are fantasy prone or, or it's because of sleep paralysis or uh, uh. false memory syndrome. I mean, it goes on and on. And basically, uh, you know, we, we didn't find any of that in, in, in the people that we work with. Now, this is an interesting point. Childhood conflict, psychosocial tension and abuse and trauma more than likely facilitated dissociative coping style in later life. How much a part dissociation plays in the abduction experience remains an open question. Um, and we found in so many cases that people that have had trauma in their childhood came up with this ability, basically, to dis disassociate, not in a psychopathological way, but to just to be, be able to handle it's, the whole situation. It's a defense, it's a defense exactly. mechanism, if exactly. I may. And, and it is, and yeah. not everybody who can disassociate mm -hmm. is in fact involved in a schizophrenic process. Exactly. It is a defense mechanism that we right. see in any kind of trauma. Right, exactly. Right on. Both experience with and interest in the abduction phenomena have impact on how one's body is perceived to function, how one views the world, as you were talking about, Wes, uh, and one's purpose in it, and how one defines or redefines one's faith, tradition, and beliefs. In essence, both experience with and interest in contact seem to change one's sense of self and one's worldview. So, uh, you know, <laughs> again, exactly what you said, Wes, you know, uh, and, and we, we certainly found that back in, you know, 2010 when we finally published this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Abductees experiences believe that there is a sentient, purposive alien intelligence at play in their lives and at work in the world. What the intelligence's goals are seem to be more beneficent than malevolent, more mm -hmm. benign than malignant. This, of course, still remains an open question. Mm -hmm. But as I said, 80% people want these experiences to continue so they can't be that bad. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and yeah. it's certainly a process where in the initial stages, almost everyone has a, a tough time. But yeah. then after five or 10, you know, experiences, it, it's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. um, the brain generally in the temporal lobes and limbic system more particularly play a mediating role in the anomalous experiences such as abduction. This in no way implies that abductions are all or only in the abductees' heads. Rather, it points to the likelihood of temporal ability as a preset or a precursor to extraordinary experiences. So, and, and you've heard probably, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gary Nolan talks about, uh, you know, his studies with the experiencers and mm -hmm. looking at that caudate putamen area. Um, and, and, you know, you've got microtubules, you've got the, the temporal lobes, you, you have, uh, I mean, it goes on and on where these things are, are, are preset in a way to be able mm -hmm. to have these experiences. Um, so it, it was a fascinating study. And as a matter of fact, we're in the process of doing the follow-on study, the Omega-4 study, which we finished the first phase of, oh. which was uh, we went out to therapists um, that work with people that have had contact and uh, had them uh, do a survey, uh, which was totally confidential. And the next phase is we're going out to uh, their clients. Uh, and again, it's a totally HIPAA compliant uh, type of a, a questionnaire mm -hmm. uh, where we hope to answer some other questions that, that haven't been asked yet. Uh, so uh, the first one, by the way, uh, is on uh, the OPUS website, which is opusnetwork.org. 
if you go into our uh, articles and documents section, you'll see the first phase of the Omega-4 study, which has some interesting um, revelations in it. That's tremendously validating for me as well. I, you know, when I appear on shows, people will say, oh, that's real validating for me, Wes. And it's like, I want to be on this end of it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, that is a, that is terrifically exciting because I I mean, Les, we're in now the era of the real time mapping of the brain. And Mm -hmm. there have been some really interesting uh, uh, brain uh, experiments uh, done inducting uh, clients or patients into past life regressions. And the what they have found and what they didn't expect to find is that in the past life regression process, which I would also imagine would be very similar if we were doing, you know, uncovering any kind of memory blockage of an ET experience or whatever. But the areas of the brain that are firing are not what we would call the creative centers where we would find confabulation and right. and and or trying to please the therapist. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why the, mm-hmm. the the areas that are firing are the deep me- memory centers, the amygdala, you know, all all that all those gizmos in there. So we are dealing with with real memories that have been chemically implanted in our in our on our hard drive, you know, the brain. I mean, the stuff is everything's accessible, I think, external to the brain as well. But the brain is the hard drive. And you know, in our in our 3D world, for people to believe that something is happening, they have to see physical 3D evidence, apparently. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm just very happy that it's uh, that it tends to uh, validate what we have always known: that uh, when you can get someone relaxed enough physically. That membrane between the conscious mind and the subconscious, where everything is stored, uh, it dissolves. And a person doesn't need to be unconscious for this to happen. They can be mm-hmm. in, in the alpha state. They could be mm-hmm. in the theta state. But this is, this is real access. And, you know, one of the reasons I know it's so valid is because most of my work is in mainstream hypnosis. Most of what pays the bills is that. So I am dealing with people losing weight, fighting cancer, getting pregnant. I mean, I mean lost her. <laughs> um, Leslie, Leslie's just cut out. So I know yeah. Les, she'll come back on. I think it was a yeah. bandwidth issue. Um, yeah. We've talked maybe about a third of the of some talking points that you can go through. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what, 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 what I was going to say about that is, is the fact that uh, – we we are yes scientifically starting to re- really get a little bit more closer to some of the answers uh, and it's 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 heartening to see the scientific community opening up and I think because of the fact that uh, um, you know the government now has uh, come out with this UAP report and that mm-hmm. they're they're seriously looking at uh, the phenomena the next step of course is to talk to the uh, experiencers. And I know that they're already doing that. The government is already doing it, but they're not saying a darn thing about it. Um, And they've been extremely interested in that kind of uh, situation that people find themselves in. uh, And again, uh, bring up Melinda Leslie, that uh, Mm -hmm. she was so, you know, basically interrogated uh, about what she knew by, you know, who were they, who were they, you know, what do they want? Uh, I mean, all those kind of questions. Um, and then you have, you have, you have stories like uh, the general in Israel, Haim Ashed, that uh, wrote the book about the fact that, well, the, yeah, we're, we're already working with the aliens and we have bases on Mars and, <laughs> yep. you know, uh, you know, it's it's it's. I think we're we're really close to having. You know, I hate to use the word disclosure, but I I think that's what probably appropriate, but more like confirmation, uh, because they, there's so many stories out there about this, and what we need is confirmation, not disclosure. <laughs> I think we're being drip fed the info. Yeah. 
in yeah. so many different ways, including Hollywood. I, this has crossed my mind for a couple mm -hmm. of decades. You know, let's draw up something else into the equation and call it fiction. Um, let's see how folks react or respond to that. And, oh, yeah. and the two major conferences on disclosure so far, um, you know, the Stephen Greers of the world and all sorts of other players involved. But I, I don't think government types are interested in talking to people like me or you for the same reason we would be. Yeah, and I, but I, I, I know from good sources that uh, <clears throat> these, these people that have had contact have been basically, uh, take uh, Chris Bledsoe and his son, Ryan. Uh, and NSA was there, the CIA was there. I mean, they were, you know, interrogating them and trying to get information and hung out there and waited for these objects to come in. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, so they, they, they know a hell of a lot more. Well, there's a nice picture. <laughs> Leslie's coming back. We, uh -oh. we were just talking, uh -oh. we were just talking about. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I, that it's one okay. was, uh, that one was photoshopped with an airbrush and a, and a blowtorch. It is a great photo. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> photo. <laughs> okay, great. Let we, me... we were just, just to catch up, Leslie, we, we kept on chatting. We were talking about disclosure and the military's interest in, uh, in talking to abductees and so forth and how, you know, how their interest and other people's interests may be a different interest. And, wow. and uh, we were just chatting about how we're being drip fed little pieces of disclosure. Oh. That's where that's what we were doing. If I see one more picture of that goddamn TikTok and Louise <laughs> Elizondo with his little stupid thing there, the little <laughs> hair thing he's got going, I hair can't thing. tolerate it. The TikTok and the boot, you know, enough already. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's insulting. It's in, it's it's insulting, is what it is. It's just insulting, and you know, um, Les, I was thinking also that you you know you've been doing this work for really a, a, a big chunk of time. So I wonder if in the beginning, when you were first working with experiencers, if you saw or engaged with more experiencers that had had uh, sort of what I, the, the Betty and Barney Hill treatment, the Zeta reticulite treatment, where they had ova extracted and sperm extracted. We don't see much of that in, or I haven't seen much of it in more contemporary experiences because I think the Truman agreement type Truman agreement timed out but were you engaging with many of these people that had had this terrible type of trauma yeah we 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 got a lot of people showing up uh, with you know real trauma yeah. <clears throat> you know and um, I've got these recordings I still have the recordings of these people and and uh it, it's quite dramatic. Uh, and again, th this is the beginning stages in most cases of their contact. Um, <clears throat> and what we did in, in those days, I would talk to them and, and uh, you know, suggest books that they could read, but also just talk to them and let them know that they're not alone, that this is not uncommon, uh, which was uh, something that uh, really worked well, if you will. Uh, to calm them down. Uh, and then we also had, uh, you know, uh, hypnotherapists that we could, uh, uh, you know, recommend. And uh, later on, uh, mental health practitioners. Uh, and and we, we have now, uh, we have our own sort of ERT, it's called the EST, which is Experience Your Support Team. Uh, and uh, which are, again, doing triage when these people contact us and yes. they, they hit our site and they can ask for being placed in the uh, online support group where we have over 300 people uh, from around the world talking like 24 seven to one another um, wow. about their experiences and asking questions. And, uh, and uh, I, Last year, I came out with a book called The Unknown Other and the Existential Proposition of Alien Contact. Oh. And in that book, I have over almost 30 stories of, from the people uh, from our support group talking about their experiences oh. and how, how Opus helped them 
-hmm. And uh, along with uh, physical and psychological issues uh, of the phenomena and uh, government and and, uh, military uh, involvement. And the full omega-3 study is actually in the book itself. Mm. So. Fantastic, fantastic. Excellent. And, and Les, how would, um, how would one acquire your book and also reach out to you if, yeah, if yeah. they wish to? The best, best way, uh, first of all, to get the book is just to go to Amazon. <laughs> or you can go to our website, opusnetwork.org. And on the home page, there's a picture of the book. <laughs> Just click on cool. it and it'll take you, take you the, to, to Amazon. Um, right, yeah. And all the proceeds of that book go directly to Opus. Um, oh. And and so uh, I'm not getting anything for it other than oh, the, yeah. the, uh, the uh, you know, good feeling, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, sure. bless your heart because this, you know, this is a grassroots movement. I think the evolved ETs, became disgustipated a long time ago with how our governments are running this world or not running it or whatever the hell's going on here and uh, decided to do it this way instead and i'm telling you it's effective and with the with the training wheels that we've got our internet which is the maybe a step to telepathic communication not sure but we got our training wheels on and we're able to engage with each other almost at the speed of thought even though it's mechanical right now. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think at, at some point we're going to reach critical mass that mm-hmm. we're going to wake up one morning and everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, we know they're here. We know who they are. We, I mean, it's all going to be like no big deal anymore. I think so. I think <laughs> my grandchildren will probably know that world. And yeah. I mean, it's not that far out. I mean, we have pictures in in ancient triptychs of beings with elongated skulls my goodness we have early kingdom egyptian mummies with only european Mm -hmm. dna who have elongated skulls we have a history of contact that we are getting better and better at sorting out with the archaeological tools and the scientific tools that are now at our disposal so it's a very exciting uh time a lot of times i wish i was out there you know at the bosnian pyramid with a little brush and a and a cool hat you know (laughs) indiana yeah that's right so um Les, if you were going to send a message now to you know the listening audience um and you know, I'm hoping it would be a message of positivity. What would you, what would you tell the experiencer who has not yet been able to find support or, or have validation, or maybe they think they're suffering me- with mental health issues or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be? What sure. would your message be to those souls I, still I, suffering? I think succinctly put, you're not alone. Um, this, is, this is something that's happening to many, many people. Um, and that there's an organization uh, that has been set up uh, to help people like yourself um, with, you know, an online support group, totally confidential online support group, referrals to mental health practitioners, hypnotherapists. Um, we're here to help. We're here to help. And uh, all you have to do is go to our website, opusnetwork.org, and there's a contact button, a support button. Uh, that you hit and you just fill out this short, very short form as to what you would like and tell a little bit about your story. And then what I will, one of us will put you into the support group or one of the EST members will contact you and and have a chat. So uh, again, you're not alone and we're here to help. Oh, well, bless you. Bless you, Les. That, that, is, you. that is the message. That's the message of Contact TV. That's your message. We are aligned. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to reach out, folks, because I'm telling you, knowledge is power. It's better to know. And there are many, many wonderful ways to uh, explore your experience hypnotherapy is not the only one so there are many wonderful mm-hmm. ways to do that with with uh, with the kind guidance of of the people that you will find through uh through les's organization and uh les 
thank you so much for joining us at last. I'm so thrilled. And uh, please come back in the very near future and, and update us on what's going on, the programs, what the trends are, things that you've mm -hmm. noticed. We we're it's our job to it's our job to get the word out. And I and we can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us today and be with us. Well, I thank you very much. Uh uh, Leslie and Wes uh, having me on the show today. Uh, it's so important uh, uh, that people like yourselves have set this kind of uh, uh, show up. Uh, we need to get the word out and you guys are doing a great job. And, and so I'm very appreciative and again, thankful for being on your show tonight. Thank Les, you thank so you much. So much. And, this was and fantastic. as we always say, our show motto we are, we not, are alone. not alone. <laughs> so we always say at the end. We, so, but yes. you. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. so thank you, All Les. Right. Fantastic. All right, Take guys. Care, thank Wes. you. Talk to you right. soon. Thank you for watching Contact TV. We would like to thank our generous sponsors, Lightwork Hypnosis, Euphoria and the Euphoria Chronicles, Earth Mystery News, Conspiracy Culture Books, MUFON Canada, Free Experiencers, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, and Variety Store Productions. For guest booking information, please email Wes Roberts at producer at contacttv.ca. And don't forget to join us on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs>